all so much for coming to my recital. I'm so thankful you all could make it. Um, it's really was my heart. Um, so today, we are going to learn about Baroque music. As you can see, I have two violins, and one is modern and one is Baroque. So let me open up books here. So you may be wondering, why did I choose to do this project on Baroque music? Well, first I wanted to um, learn more about the genre since I participated in my high school Baroque ensemble um, at Davis uh, Senior High School. And um, so I really enjoyed learning about the Baroque style in general and how it differs from uh, you know, just modern performance in all aspects of that. Um, I also wanted to further my understanding of um, ensemble inner workings, such as um, trio sonatas and solo sonatas, and I'll be playing both of, you, both of that for you today. Um, I also wanted to um, learn more about how the different composers furthered the Baroque styles that um, Telemann and Corelli. So I also want to give a special shout out to my Baroque violin coach, Gabrielle Lynch, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today, but um, she's watching via live stream, and um, I'm so grateful for all the guidance she's given me on this project. And um, uh, <laughs> last night, I was really paranoid that my Eastern was going to break, and so we were talking about it because, you know, sometimes these things happen, and I was like, oh no, it's spraying, and she just gave me a lot of good advice on what to do, and so I don't think I could have done this without her. Um, um, I'm going to study the um, two main types of sonatas from the Baroque era. First, uh, the trio sonata by Telemann, and then the solo by sonata by Corelli. And um, let's see here. So let's get into some fundamental differences between different genres, so classical and Baroque. So I'm going to um, help put these differences into perspective by playing an excerpt of Bach A minor's concerto first movement on the modern violin and then on the Baroque violin. And um, just kind of listen for what you hear. Bach A minor concerto first movement on the modern violin. So now that you've heard different, um, two different methods of playing it, let's go into some set of differences on the Baroque violin. Uh, so you may have noticed that um, it sounds different. This is because it is um, R tuned to R A flat. A modern A flat was the same as a 
A in the Baroque era, so they would still call um, our A flat an A, but the modern A is tuned to 440 versus the Baroque A, which is tuned to 415. We will be playing at 415 for all of the pieces today. So this is tuned to our A flat, so. Um, also, it has no chin rest, and Hold up, Nathan. Um, <laughs> he goes, keyboard students are probably uh, noticing the difference in shoulder rest. Um, but so, no chin rest. Um, and along with the shorter neck, uh, I mean, shorter fingerboard, um, this was because the instrumentalists didn't shift as much, so they didn't need that extra um, support. Um, also, the strings are made of gut. Yes, gut, so very natural. Um, they uh, mainly were made of sheep or goat intestine, um, so very, um, very eco-friendly, <laughs> um, as opposed to steel or um, plastic. Um, so on the modern violin, the, all the strings are wound with metal, and on the Baroque violin, only the key string is wound with metal. So um, this gives, obviously, a different tone um, going further into that, um, the sound of the Baroque violin is more open and natural than that of the <clears throat> because, again, the, the gut strings just provide more of like a non-tethered um, energy. Um, and so you'll hear that in a lot of open, long um, strings. Um, and so they also break a lot, and they're very sen uh, sensitive to temperature changes, which is why I've seen me tuning multiple times throughout this recital. Um, so if you're looking for an economically viable way to start learning about Baroque music, this is probably not it, because um, these strings cost like $100 per, per set if you're going cheap. Um, I don't, yeah. Um, and then going up to the bow, so uh, I'll do my best with this. So you can see that the length is a lot shorter on the Baroque bow. This is the Baroque modern. So it also has a pointed end, and this is a more subtle difference. But the shape of the Baroque, uh, the violin, the excuse me, the shape of the modern bow is in a um, concave. So inward and then the Baroque bow is in a convex shape. So it's more like a watermelon and, you know, depending on how you that, I guess. But I'm just in and out pretty much. And so this accomplishes a much different sound. So for violinists, you will know that um, you're supposed to really maintain the sound throughout the bow, but this is different on, in a Baroque setting because you're supposed to um, kind of um, accent the middle part of the bow, and then this really creates um, a welling of sound with a rapid decrease. So musicians will definitely, um, I'll say vibe with this, because um, it's very like, it's very powerful, the difference in bow distribution. So the weight is more toward the frog on the tip, so if I go like this, very easy to do that. Um, so when you're watching videos of pro musicians, you'll see them swing to the music um, back and forth in a strong weak pattern. And this is because of mainly the bow shape, which is um, so strong down, strong down bow and very light up bow. And you can listen for that as well when we play the bow pieces. So moving on to some differences between the um, French and Italian Baroque style. So uh, in terms of instrumentation, it's pretty much the same. So you would see like violin, the quarter, or harpsichord, or violin, viola da gamba, harpsichord, so treble instrument and bass. Um, and then in terms of differences, French style was very um, refined. It was very subject to nobility. So you would have to be invited to see um, a performance by any musician. So this was very subject to like 
people with lots and lots and lots of money, versus French, which was, I mean, uh, excuse me, Italian, which is very extravagant and virtuosic and just, you know, all about the music. And um, it was more public, though, so you could see it more frequently and in less of a um, private setting. So you could see it, but not have to be rich, <laughs> which is very refreshing. So, a quote from Juilliard, um, French, music, French musicians aim to thrill the senses via the intellect with sensory perceptions serving comprehension, while the Italians focused on the direct expression of emotion via flamboyant virtuoso vocalists and emotions. Uh, instrumentation, excuse me. So, moving on to some information about the first piece on our program tonight. Philip George, George Philip Talamon was a German composer, and um, I don't know if he got his birthday to that for him, um, but he was influenced by the French style, and even though he was a German composer, um, this piece that we'll be playing tonight is written in the French style. He was properly introduced to, Italian, uh, to French music while enrolled in um, the Hindenstrom Gymnasium around 1700, and he really got to explore this genre while going to multiple concerts um, in that program. So he also borrowed musical techniques from Weber and Rameau, other two famous Baroque composers in that era. So some specifics about this piece that I'd like you to listen for are um, first, you know, just it's a trio sonata, so that voicing will definitely influence just dissonance. So mainly, um, there'll be a lot of like controversy between the violin and the um, recorder, and some some between um, the other the two voices and the harp recorder. But mainly between the two first voices, and then um, there will also be a lot of contrapuntal texture. So meaning between the three voices, um, and then lastly, a lot of ornamentation. And this will mainly be seen through uh, trills and scales and stuff like that. Um, a lot of it is not specifically written in the piece, but you just kind of have to like figure it out on your own. Um, and uh, I will now invite Carl and Phoenix to join me on stage to play this amazing piece.
to our second piece of the evening. Um, um, so Corelli was uh, an Italian composer, and he was mainly the um, violin virtuoso and violin performance influencer of um, the former, you know, TikTok influencers of the uh, Baroque era. And so he was, you know, a hotshot. And so he um, he really influenced the ornamentation and the overall way that people even held the violin in those days. And um, a quote from the Philharmonia Baroque, his emphasis on melody and accompaniment helped to, surf, uh, to soften stricter aspects of counterpoint. Um, and so some specifics about this piece that you're going to take to listen for is the um, difference from the Taliban. And that's mainly just the more virtuosic aspect of this piece. Um, you will see a lot of double stops, which um, kind of go into that virtuosity. Um, and so also a lot of ornamentation. Um, well, uh, well, that's a different um, recital. Um, the, uh, <laughs> the, um, the ornamentation that Corelli wrote for this piece is um, it's very subtle. He didn't actually write a lot of it himself, but he expected the instrumentalist to just add on what they thought was necessary. And so in the score for this piece, you see a lot of like just chords written out, like D major, E major, you know, all the chords, and then you're supposed to ornament them as, um, as you see fit. And so there'll be a part of this song where um, it'll, It'll just be a lot of noodling, but at the base of that are the chords. And um, also, you'll see a lot of trills, arpeggios, um, just general noodling. <laughs> um, and so, I, to demonstrate this, I'm going to play uh, the opening of the Corelli without and then with ornamentation, so you can kind of get a sense of what it actually sounds like. Um, movement of the Corelli uh, Sonata in uh, or D major, sorry. with the corner.
We have learned so much about road music today, but if you're interested in learning more, um, you can just Google play it. <laughs> Actually, I have some reputable names that you can look up. Um, so some, some well-known Baroque musicians um, are Richard Webb. He is a retired Baroque cellist who coached our um, Baroque ensemble in high school. And um, he's still around. Um, he wasn't going to be my coach, but um, some circumstances prevented that. But a um, great musician, and Rachel Barton Pine, some of you may know her, she is um, a rock, classical, and baroque violinist, so hardcore. And um, others include Monica Hudgett, Simo Platonos, who visited here, I think, um, the year that we got speak of, and, um, <laughs> and uh, Andrew Mance. So, and we do have time. Um, does anybody have any questions for me? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, so can you tell people what it was like to go back and forth between playing the modern violin and the baroque violin? Yeah, definitely. I think the main thing for me was, well, it was kind of a pain in the ass looking those two instruments around. Um, but I would love to play the tune, just like, you know, doing farm workouts. Um, I think the main, um, main issue for me was the type of bow weight that I was using, um, which is a very specific aspect, but um, just kind of like practicing more like carving into the string with this instrument versus getting a really sustained tone um, on the modern. And just so like, you know, like Vivaldi and Brahms are two completely different um, sounds. And so you really have to be mindful of how you're using the bow to create that energy. So the Taliban is written, uh, I'm sorry, the Karelic is written without the flourish. Mm -hmm. How do you determine what flourish to add? Well, um, a Baroque coach really helps. Um, I, uh, we had an improv um, master class the other day, and a lot of it was centered around um, add, whatever you add, it should be related to the, the basic chord that you're playing. So. If it's in D, then you should have notes that match that sound. Um, and then uh, just, you know, kind of letting yourself get out of your comfort zone. Um, a lot of us classical musicians are really trying to just read what's on the page. And I think this project really helped me to step outside of that and just kind of, if I play a wrong note, then that's not a wrong note, that's just me really doing things. So the two people play the same piece, it would sound very different. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, how was the shift in pitch from A to A flat or to G? Since I did some prior work with this instrument in high school, I think it was less of a shift for me, but um, I think like just the it was sounds almost like a macaulay in A flat, but an A. An A is very just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just going to ask if it was hard to have so much fun learning to play with the broad or without the Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> um, I think once you add on the other parts of the Baroque, music, like ornamentation, you kind of just don't have room in your brain to also vibrate. So, it, you know, a lot of it was that, but um, I think um, also listening to recordings of people not using vibrato just kind of gets your mind in that, like, you know, like, it's okay to like vibrato, even though the lot is Uh, on a personal level, what do you need to uh, spend the most? Sorry, again? On a personal level, what do you need to uh, spend the most time about the Um, well, I, um, I 
I really like the um, aspect of standing up while playing. So I think like in a professional setting, it just is more freeing. Um, of course, playing in a symphony orchestra definitely has its benefit, but I think in, especially in a chamber music setting, it's very like, you can just interact with the people you're playing more. And um, I guess it's just a different type of music that I'm not, I don't know as much, so that makes me want to learn about it even more. And it's kind of a, you know, a hot new genre now, so there's mm -hmm. lots of like early music and baroque music, so I feel like there are a lot of professional opportunities for that as well. Is there any difference in Rosin? Um, well, one that I got, the rental was free, so yeah, but um, <laughs> <laughs> technically no. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming to my recital, and there will be a reception in Buck 113 with food and drink and general good vibes.